What's up, guys? Welcome to our Saturday Rewind. This is our opportunity to share last week's word so we prepare our hearts for tomorrow's word. And we are still in our series, Unsung. Last week, we talked about don't take it personal. First Samuel chapter 8 is a impactful passage where we see where Samuel honestly has to face rejection. How do we manage rejection? How do we manage life when our name is not called? And I think this is a really important sermon because it challenges all of us. All of us will live in that at some point. As we're preparing ourselves to hear our word tomorrow at 9, 11, and 5, continuing and coming to the climax of our Unsung series, make sure that you listen intently to this word. I believe it's going to be helpful. I know it helped me. And I believe at the end of the day, don't personalize your rejection. Know that God still has a greater plan for you. God bless you. Love you. It's been said that those who make the greatest impact are not always those who are the most gifted, nor are they even the most talented. They're not even the most influential. What makes their impact great is that they remain faithful. Not everyone will celebrate them or even speak highly of them, but they know that they must make the courageous decision to live for God even when they aren't noticed. They are found in unexpected places, making a difference in unexpected ways. Because in the end, that's what truly matters. That's what people will remember. In a time where there is so much pressure to perform, we need those who will choose faithfulness over fame. These are our unsung heroes. Welcome back to another opportunity for us to explore the Word of God. I greet you with the joy of Jesus Christ. I'm excited once again to be able to share what I believe is going to be an impactful word that God is going to challenge us, stretch us, and make us better. Before we jump into the Word of God today, let us pray. God, we thank you and we bless you. It is our desire today that through the Word of God that we'll be made better. We are excited to be able to travel again to learn more about the life of a man by the name of Samuel and how his life applies to ours. And so, God, we pray that we once again use the word as a mirror to be able to look at ourselves and see which ways we can be better for your glory. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Once again, we've been journeying through the book of 1 Samuel on a series entitled Unsung. This is simply a series that gives us the opportunity to look at what it means to live a faithful but uncelebrated life. And over the last few weeks, we've been engaging the story of a man by the name of Samuel. And as we began to go through the progression of Samuel's life, we began to see some things from his genesis, his birth, from his mother Hannah, to him being set apart to be different. We saw how he was able to hear and ascertain and even discern the voice of God, and even able to take that voice and speak up, And even to the point of understanding that there was a major part where God's presence was needed. And Samuel got the people of God back together by simply letting them know that God is our Ebenezer. He's our stone of help. When we think about that, the progression of Samuel's life, it puts into play the reality that if we are to be faithful, that there are going to be some ups and downs. There are going to be moments of prominence, but also there's going to be moments of rejection. I never forget, I grew up in Greensboro, North Carolina, and there were two major basketball courts in my neighborhood. There was Blueford Basketball Court, and there was Hook Street. As a kid, you wanted to make sure that your name was known in both of those places. And so as a kid growing up, I would work out in my backyard because I wanted, when time came, to get picked at either Blueford Court or at Hook Street Court. And I'll never forget one pivotal moment. There we were, all of my friends in the neighborhood. We happened to be at Blueford. And they were having two captains pick teams. Anybody that's been there know that that can be a tense moment when they are picking teams. And I sat there. I've been working hard, working on my left hand, working on my right hand, working on my shot. I knew that I was in position to be a top pick. That day, I'll never forget, seems as if they kept overlooking me and Who wants to be the dreaded last pick? Because the last pick literally is not even a pick. It's just they just take you because there's no one else to take. And in life, that sometimes happens. No matter how much time you put in, how how much effort you put in, no matter how gifted you think you are, 
Here's what I want to challenge you with today's sermon is what do you do when you are not the choice? That that's really crucial. And as we go to 1 Samuel chapter 8, I want to lift this passage up. Because in this narrative, we see Samuel, this great priest and prophet and judge of Israel, not be the choice. And here is the challenge of this, because here's the tension before I even read the scripture for you, is I want you to know that a lot of times there is incongruency between the validation that God gives us and appreciation from people. And when we get to that place, we must understand that just because you have been validated by God does not mean you will be accepted by people. First Samuel chapter 8 lifts that thought up for us. Let me read it for you, found in the Good News Translation. And I think it begins to put into perspective how we can view this moment when we are not the choice. 1 Samuel 8, beginning around verse 1, when Samuel grew old, he made his sons judges in Israel. The older son was named Joel, and the younger one, Abijah. They were judges in Beersheba, but they did not follow their father's example. They were interested only in making money, so they accepted bribes and did not decide cases honestly. Then all the leaders of Israel met together, went to Samuel and Ramah, and said to him, Look, you are getting old, and your sons don't follow your example. So then appoint a king to rule over us, so that we will have a king as other countries have. Samuel was displeased with their request for a king, so he prayed to the Lord. And the Lord said to him, Listen to everything the people say to you. You're not the one they have rejected. I'm the one they have rejected as their king. And ever since I brought them out of Egypt, they have turned away from me and worshiped other gods. And now they're doing to you what they've always done to me. So then listen to them, but give them strict warnings and explain how their kings will treat them. Look again, verse 7, and the Lord said, listen to everything the people say to you. You're not the one they have rejected. I'm the one they have rejected as their king. If I could just talk for a little while today with that thought and that tension of trying to navigate this validation of God and sometimes the appreciation of people, that I think the word that Samuel's given in his prayer time with God is crucial for us. Because in those moments of rejection, this is my simple word to you, don't take it personal. In life, that is the truth. <laughs> and it happens because that is what is on this text. Samuel, this great man of God, we've seen him grow, we've seen him mature. We've seen how he's evolved from this child that was raised and reared in the temple to being the unquestioned spiritual leader of Israel. I mean, last time we came to Samuel, in Samuel, 1 Samuel chapter 7, the Ark of the Covenant had came back. Samuel had once again commissioned the people to make sure that they cleansed themselves of idols, made sure that they knew that it was about time that they put God first. And because of that, they saw God move in an incredible way. And by the time 1 Samuel chapter 7 concludes, it is no question, there is no doubt Who's in charge in Israel? Matter of fact, Samuel at that point has lived in relative ease. The Philistines have stopped bothering the children of Israel. Samuel has already negotiated them to recapture the cities that had been taken. And yes, they were now at peace with their neighbors, the Canaanites. By the time we get to that portion, you must understand that all things are rolling good in the life of Israel and in particular Samuel. Matter of fact, he goes everywhere. He is the unquestioned judge. He's carrying on this great mantle. Matter of fact, he honors and is faithful to God. Matter of fact, as we conclude chapter 7, it lets us know he even builds an altar to honor God. But then the page turns. And the Bible tells us it gets to chapter 8 and all things start to shift as high as chapter 7 is in the life of Samuel and Israel, something shifts. There's no attack of an enemy, no. There's no famine in the land, no. The presence of God is still there. But somehow, someway, when we read chapter 8, the text tells us a desire has raised up in the land. The desire that is raised up in the land is that the children of Israel now want a king. 
This is crucial because if I could go back, I could argue that there was provisions put into the writ and covenant of God to his people that at some point they would get a king. But understand God's main intent throughout his history thus far. God's main intent is to be the sole king of Israel. And so what's interesting, if I was to approach this passage, on one hand, you'll note that what happens, the story simply tells us, they take their desire to Samuel, Samuel is mad about it, takes it to God, and what does God do? God says, allow it. God says, cool, they want a king, I'm going to give them a king. Now, on one hand, if I was to approach this passage from the perspective of the nation of Israel, I would tell you, you got to be careful what you ask for. And sometimes God... Bless, burdens us by blessing us. Because you read in 1 Samuel chapter 8, if you go between verses 10 through 22, it is where Samuel gives them the narrative of what happens if they were to get a king. He's going to enslave your sons and he's going to drive your daughters. Y'all were going to be in endless wars. He was trying to warn them, but their desire for a king was even greater than the consequences. And at some point, sometimes in all of our lives, we can be like the nation of Israel. That we could want something so bad, even though it's not going to be good for us. Oh, well, before you go ahead and blame them, how many of us, I included, have desired something that we know was not going to be good for us? And we kept bargaining with God, and God kept telling you, now, you know this is going to happen. That's okay, God. I can handle it. But, but you do know this. not going to be treating you right, but I'm okay, God. I'm tired of being by myself. And sometimes, if we're not careful, we can end up like the nation of Israel who wanted a king, got a king, and wished they hadn't had a king. But the real narrative behind this, beyond this passage for me, and them getting the king is the person that I want to lift Samuel because if you think about it from Samuel's perspective, Samuel literally gets rejected twice in this passage. One, by the children of Israel, and two, by God. I mean, think about it from this perspective. I mean, Samuel is the unquestioned judge of Israel. He is the priest and the prophet, but the people don't appreciate him. And when he takes it to God, I can't imagine that when he prays to God, he's thinking God's going to take my back. God's going to stand up for me. God's going to tell them, you don't need a king. You got Samuel. But what does God do in this passage? God tells Samuel, in essence, I'll do what they want me to do. And the odd man out in this narrative is Samuel. He did nothing wrong. He's been faithful. He's been honoring God. But yet, he's been rejected. He's rejected by the people. And also, if you were to look at it from this angle, he can feel rejected by God. In other words, Samuel in 1 Samuel chapter 8 is not the choice. And the progression is now going to move forward. The nation of Israel is going to continue on. And from this point forward, as great as Samuel's been, he's not going to be who they wanted. And at some point, you and I will have to be in the seat of Samuel. That for us, I don't care how gifted you are. I don't care how much you think you got everything together. Let's be honest. From time to time, we're not going to be the choice. You're going to get overlooked. It, that You may be the one that has all the credentials and still may not get the promotion. You may be the one that has it all together and you have got yourself together and still the relationship may not work. And at some point even in ministry, and I've been there when so many people see you're gifted and talented and they say, man, I love to hear you do this and I love to hear you do that only to not hear your name called. What happens when we live between that tension of appreciation and validation because that tension, my brothers and sisters, is rejection. And for all of us, Samuel teaches us, it doesn't matter how anointed you are, you can be rejected. It doesn't matter how much you love God, you can be rejected. 
But here's my word that I want to share with you, the word that the Lord tells Samuel in this passage. And this is what I simply want you to know, that when we live in those seasons of rejection, when uh, is not our time, when uh, our name is not being called, when uh, we're not appreciated on one hand and accepted on the other, this is the hardest thing uh, that we have to embrace. But God uh, tells Samuel this. He says, I know you feel rejected, but this is what I need you to do. Don't take it personal. And how many of us, if we'll be honest, take it personal? As soon as our name doesn't get called, we get angry. As soon as we feel we got overlooked, we believe that it's some vendetta against us. But notice in the text that God gives rationale to Samuel's rejection. God says, they didn't reject you. They really rejected me. In other words, what we see that Samuel has to endure like other great leaders, like Moses, and yes, even like Jesus, that in life you will get rejected, that you will be overlooked. There will be people who do not think you fit the bill. And you have to, for your whole sake and your spiritual well-being, have to push aside, step back, and don't take it personal. I wonder who I'm helping today. Maybe I'm just helping myself but I wonder how can we navigate that? Because here's the reason why most of us take it personal. Because there is a part of us that believes that God's plan evolves and revolves around us. There's a reason why we get offended when they don't call our name. Because for some reason we assume that God's move cannot progress without us as much as we bring to the table. And so sometimes we have to step back because we personalize it because we don't feel like anything can happen unless we're included. And here is something that Samuel has to learn the hard way and something you and I have to learn the hard way that God's plan and God's purpose does not always include us. That sometimes in life that some things will just keep rolling on. I know you're wonderful and grand and special, but there are some things that even I as a pastor have had to come to grips with is that God's will is bigger than me. And at some point I'm not going to be here. At some point you're not going to get your name called and so the best we can do is with the time God gives us is to give our absolute best. But when things don't go the way we don't want it to go, the thing you must do is don't take it personal. That I have to understand that this is part of God's will. And if I trust him when my name is called, I also got to trust him when my name is not called. If he's God when it's up here, then he's the same God when it's down there. Samuel had to learn that the hard way. And I want to look at that because I think that this is a wonderful opportunity for us to do the self-evaluation. Because if we'll be honest, it gets hard. We personalize it. We get angry. We get hatred in our hearts. We start to get upset. And then if we're not careful, if we personalize it, we get paralyzed from being progressive and moving to where God wants us to be. This is an important moment because how Samuel manages this moment determines what else God will use him to be. Can I look at some things? Let me just lift up some principles, maybe some application from this text. Because I do think that what we see in these few verses allows us to understand how to manage it and how to, even on rough days like not being the choice, of others, even though we feel validated by God, ways to not take it personal. Well, I think that if we were to really examine this closely, that, that perhaps a good way to not personalize it, to not get disillusioned with disapproval, is number one, admit our areas of shortcoming. See, see, what's interesting about this passage of Scripture is that as high as chapter 7 is, chapter 8 is the reality of Samuel's life. A couple of things are told to us. He's getting older, and his sons don't have what he had. Now, it's interesting that the writer of 1 Samuel does not condemn Samuel for the issues at home. We, we get some insight uh, that Samuel has some sons that were raised and these sons are working under their father. But it's according to the text that the sons don't have the same intuitive or even integrity that Samuel has. 
They're dishonest. They're stealing stuff. They're working in the house of God, but they have no character when it comes to doing it. They, they do not resemble at all their father Samuel. So it's interesting to note here that the writer of Samuel outlines that. This has been a thing that we've seen. We've seen parents and fathers and mothers doing extraordinary things only to have it messed up by their children. Now, for one hand, the thing, the writer of Samuel does not condemn Samuel. He condemned Eli because he says that Eli should have reigned his sons in. There's been others who have been lifted in scripture uh, who had children that went wayward. But Samuel is somehow excluded from condemnation in this passage. But yet, even though he's not explicitly told that it's his fault that his sons are not operating in integrity, we do see this as a chink in his armor. That for all the great things Samuel has done is this one area of imperfection. This one shortcoming that has caused him to be considered disqualified. One area that he's not strong in. Because of this it forces the leaders of the nation of Israel to come to him and tell him their desire for a king. They mainly lift up, hey man you are old and we don't trust your sons. It's something about your legacy, Samuel, that is an area of weakness. And since it seems as if you can't train your sons, that this is an opening for us to want a king. Let me just approach it from this perspective because I think this passage of scripture, regardless of how you want to interpret it, to me, it really begins to just make us examine ourselves to say that all of us, have some shortcomings. Samuel's was his son's, but what's your shortcoming? What is the thing in your life that you don't do well? I know that for many of us, we want to assume that we are the bantian of perfection, that we do everything perfect, but no, if the truth be told, all of us have some shortcomings. We have areas of weakness that we're just not that good in. And as great as Samuel was in one part of his life, there was a shortcoming. And this shortcoming gave a way or bridge for his disapproval. Let's be honest. Maybe you have a shortcoming. I know you have exemplary marks. And I mean, you do incredible presentations well, but you got a shortcoming. You don't always show up to work on time. Uh, or let's say you, you're wonderful with children. You do an incredible job with kids, but you gossip. All of us, if we will examine ourselves, have areas of shortcomings. And if we do not be honest about them, we cannot address them. That's one of the things that I appreciate about the passage. As we've been navigating through the life of Samuel, I mean, let's be honest. We've been talking about Samuel. And up to this point, Samuel seems perfect. He's done everything right. He's been in the temple. He's been following God. He's been just praying. He's been instituting all this stuff. But there still was an area of weakness. And I want to submit to you that in reading this, that really gave me hope because it let me know that it does not matter how perfect our public persona is, all of us have shortcomings. And maybe if Samuel could think back, he could say, you know what, that was an area I could have been better at. What places in your life could you be better at? I know you feel like it was, it was them, that, that, that they just had a personal vendetta against you, but... If you really think about it, did you give them reason not to accept you? Did you, I mean, come on, I, I know you're not going to admit it, and I know this is not going to go on Facebook, and it's not going to share on Instagram, but all of us, if the truth be told, have something that is considered a shortcoming. And if the truth be told, that thing could be the very thing that gets your name excluded. And because of all the great things that Samuel has done, text is clear that this one area of his life is what opened the door for them to desire a king. And if we'll be honest, and this is just for our own self-evaluation, 
that I got to realize hey, I could have been better in this area. And I have to admit my areas of shortcomings. But not only that, do we have to also admit our weaknesses as a way to not take it personal, but also, number two, we must acknowledge our struggle with our feelings. When they come to Samuel, now note, this is a concerted thing. Now, note, it does not say just the people come to him. No, it says the leaders come to him, which gives us the idea they were meeting behind Samuel's back to come up with a plan to tell Samuel they wanted a king. These were probably people that Samuel had worked with, people that Samuel had grown in camaraderie with. I mean, he was the unquestioned judge and priest and prophet for Israel. And so you can imagine that he was probably caught off guard. He assumed that I'll just let my sons take over. I'm getting older. I mean, I've done all I can do. Y'all have seen my work. And they came to him with this one thought, we want a king. You can imagine this was no spur of the moment decision. You can imagine they had been meeting behind Samuel's back for a while, waiting for the moment to let him know what they wanted. And for Samuel, I can imagine he was probably caught off guard. His, his mind was, I'll just continue this thing on. I'm going to keep serving until I can't serve no more. Then my sons will take over and I'll just be the judge emeritus or the priest emeritus or the prophet emeritus. Only for those he thought he had a good working relationship with come and tell him they no longer wanted him. And I appreciate Samuel's response here because the text says when Samuel gets the word, it says Samuel is displeased. A better rendering in the Hebrew might be uh, he didn't like what they said. And I appreciate Samuel's testimony in this passage because I think for many of us, we try to over-spiritualize everything. But Samuel in our text receives something that caught him off guard and Samuel responds like a human should respond, displeased. I mean, I appreciate the fact that Samuel in our text admits this is not what I wanted to hear. He literally gets in his feelings. He's caught off guard. He's hurt. He's been ambushed. And what I appreciate about Samuel is that he gives you and I permission that at times, things are not going to go our way. And sometimes we can be so over-spiritual, oh, that's all right, I know God is in control. No, at some point, our humanity ought to say, I don't like this. I'm hurt that you are not choosing me. I'm hurt that I feel like you were meeting and did not want to include me in the meeting. And here in our text, Samuel has to deal with his feelings. Because being rejected does not feel good. Being overlooked does not feel good. Being excluded does not feel good. When you're not the choice, oh, come on. I know some of us try to smile and grin and bear it, but it's difficult. And that's Samuel's area is now he's got to deal with these feelings of displeasure, this feeling of rejection. But what I appreciate about Samuel is Samuel does something that most of us do not do. Samuel didn't get mad and go straight to social media. And write a post declaring and decreeing how awful people are. No. He didn't get mad and throw stuff at the people. No, that's not what he did. He didn't go ahead and deride them and tell them, listen, I know you ain't going to be nothing. See, that's what's going to happen. No, he didn't go there. But he took his displeasure. He took his angst. Perhaps he even took his anger. And the text says this. He went and prayed to God. I know this, this might sound real sophomore, but I will tell you from personal experience that oftentimes when you are hurt and you are disappointed, the best thing to do is not push sin, but get on your knees. Pray to God. Listen, there was something that my grandmother used to always tell me that we can take everything to God in prayer. Oh, what needless pain we bear. 
God is not just big enough to handle our good days, but he can also handle our bad days. He is not just God to handle our promotions, but he can also handle our disappointments. I appreciate in this moment when Samuel could have lost it, and I know he was probably feeling to himself, man, I just did all this for you, but he decides to take his disappointment and his displeasure to God. And I wonder how many times have we ruined what potentially could have been a great relationship because we didn't know how to manage our displeasure. We allow the first thing out of our heart to come out of our mouth without first speaking to God. And I wonder what would happen if Samuel would have quirked out in that moment. Well, I'm done. Then he never would have been given and afforded the opportunity to not just anoint one, but two of the kings of Israel. If he would have lost his mind then, what doors were closed on him? Come on, let's be honest. How many of us, if we had it, wish we could go back and turn back the hands of time? There's some words we wish we could have grabbed while they were coming out of our mouths. And part of spiritual maturity is realizing I can't take this personal, but I need to know how to, in a mature way, manage my disappointment and manage my feelings. I've seen so many people ruin their lives, their careers, because of a temporary situation. And just because you didn't get chosen in this one, don't mean you won't get chosen in the next one. But if you go ahead and blow up and get mad and allow your displeasure to make you move outside of how God wants you to respond, I wonder how many opportunities would be closed. All of us can think about that. And here, he's honest. No, this hurt. I am upset I am disappointed I feel like I should have been it but he does not go back at them no the text says he talks to God and I know it may sound neophyte but I believe what grandma and you say just a little talk with Jesus makes everything all right don't take it personal because if the truth be told all of us got areas of shortcomings. You can't take it personal, but we must acknowledge our own struggle with our feelings. And here's the third and final thing. I can't take it personal because this is something Samuel shows us that we got to accept the truth of our limitations. Notice what they ask for. We want a king. Samuel, for all of his greatness, was a great judge was a great priest, was an amazing prophet, but he was not gifted or called to be a king. So at this point, he has to understand that what I've been gifted in and good at fits where God has anointed me. So I got to understand that I can't get mad because I'm not fitting a position I was never anointed to feel. See, part of our challenge in this text is that all of us want to assume that we can be great at everything. No, at some point, you got to understand I've been good as a judge. I've been good as a prophet. I've been good as a priest, but I'm not a king. And when you know your limitations, when you know what you've been gifted and graced to do, you don't get mad when you don't get chosen for something outside your favor. I know, I know that's hard for us because for many of us, you would assume that that should be the next progression. But understand that in the calling of Samuel from the time he was birthed from his mother's barren wound, he was told what he was going to be. And none of those things was a king. So why should he get mad about something he was never meant to be? Why should he get mad about shoes he was never called to feel. At some point, it takes true spiritual maturity to know I am good here, but that's not my lane. And for many people, I will admit to you, we struggle because too many of us want to be king when God called you to be a judge. 
And one of the worst burdens to bear is a weight you was never built to carry. And in this moment, if we look at it from that perspective, that's what Samuel had to come to grips with. The Lord said, listen, Samuel, they ain't rejecting you. They rejected me. I'm their soul king. But since they don't want me, I need you to tell them what is next for them. In other words, the reason why Samuel and the reason why you and I shouldn't take it personal is because what God has for you and I, it is for you and I. And even though Samuel's feelings were hurt, he must come to grips with who he was called and crafted to be. There is peace in the fact you know who you are. And maybe that's how Samuel got through it. Maybe that's how, as Samuel continues to sojourn, is able to reconcile the fact that even though he was not called to be king, he would be the one to anoint the king. And for you and I, it gets hard to realize there's some spaces God never intended us to be. So when I think about it in that term, it wasn't rejection. Because I can't be rejected from something that was never mine in the first place. Maybe that's the lesson to be learned in this passage. Is that at some point, be okay with where God has you. Everybody's not called to be king, but you can be the best judge and priest and prophet that you can be. And maybe that's how Samuel was able to move on. Maybe that's how Samuel was able to progress past this moment of disappointment and disillusionment and disapproval is because he knew at the end of the day, I was never called to be a king. I wonder how many dreams and desires have been dashed because we're chasing after stuff that was never meant for us. How many of us have crashed and burned because we go after things that is beyond our boundary of grace? Samuel was grace to be judge, grace to be priest, grace to be prophet. He was not grace to be king. And I see this all the time in life and in ministry. Is we got a whole lot of people that desire things outside of their grace. I'd rather be a great judge than a horrible king. I'd rather be a great second in command than a horrible general. Joseph, the most favorite man in the Bible, I love to say this. We talk about him and we talk about his coat of many colors. But here's the crazy thing about the story of Joseph. He never made it to the top spot. Every level that you see him succeed in from Potiphar's house, from the prison to the palace, he was always second in command. He never made it to the top. And we consider Joseph the most favored of all the people in the Bible. I submit that his favor was simply in the fact that he never exceeded his grace. That's why at some point I've learned, and this is hard. Lord knows most of us think back in life and there's much that we perhaps regret. Relationships that didn't last. Positions on jobs that quit opportunities we thought we were overlooked in and for many of us you're probably still stung with it the disappointment probably still hurts even today but they sang that song when I was a kid what God has for me it is for me that means I got to put on my true spiritual maturity and realize that even though it's rejection, I can't take this person. Even though I feel hurt by it, I can't take it personal. 
Because the Bible is clear, according to Revelation, that no one opens a door that God has closed. And no one can close a door that God has opened. Which means every opportunity, every promotion comes from God. Which means if it does not work out for me, it wasn't meant for me. So I can either stay mad and wallow and get upset or keep being the best me that I can be. And whenever I get to that door, that opportunity that is for me, I know that God will open it. Listen, I want to pray with you. I know this was a hard word, but listen, hear my heart. Don't take it personal. God, we thank you again for the opportunity to be able to be challenged by the word. And in this moment, help us. Sam, you had to go through this place of tension called rejection between validation and acceptance. We know he was hurt and we know it had to be blindsiding him. But God, you reminded him that they're not rejecting him. They're really rejecting you, which meant that this was really not about Samuel. So Lord, help us like Samuel to admit that we have areas of shortcomings, that we will struggle with our feelings. God, at the end of the day, let us know that there are limitations to how you have placed the grace on our lives. So Lord, we're not going to take it personally when the door gets closed. We're not going to take it personal when our name does not get called. But God, what we simply say is what you have for us, let it be for us. Let us appreciate not just open doors, but closed doors as well. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Listen, as we prepare our hearts to partner with one another, what a great opportunity for us to come in unity. Unity in Christ and unity in church. There's multiple ways that you can join. You can text to join, which is a phenomenal tool. We're grateful for so many who are partnering with us. You can also email us at connectwithus at tbcaugusta.org or even go to our website, tbcaugusta.org or even while we're live now, Go right there to the comment section. Our I team can, can push you uh, to our online prayer Zoom rooms, our online assimilation Zoom rooms. We have people ready to pray with you in person and connect with you in person. If you're here today, say, listen, I need a pastor and I need a church. Just put that hand up and say, I'm ready to partner with TBC. I'm ready to be a part of what God is doing at the most impactful place on the planet. If that's you, we would absolutely love a chance to connect with you. Listen, I'm so grateful for each and every one of you. I am grateful of how God is working in your life and what we've learned today. And I hope that it helps you. That there's going to be seasons that we're going to have not be chosen. But listen, don't take it personal. Listen, I love you, but God loves you best. We conclude every service this way by lifting our hands and repeating these words, because I've been blessed, I'm going to be a blessing. Go in peace and may the God of peace go with you as well. What's up, Tab iFam? We are so glad that you've chosen to join us for another Tab Global Experience. Yo, Z, we don't ever get tired no, of saying that. We, we are glad to see you today. You could have chosen anywhere to worship, yes. but you decided to show up here today. We pray that it has been, you know, life-changing. It has been transformative. You know, yes. at Tab, that's what we exist for. Yeah. We exist, you know, to make an impact exactly. uh, for Jesus in this world. Yo, mm -hmm. we just finish another sermon in the series unsung. Yes, there are going to be things yeah. that are going to be said to us, yeah. uh, things that are going to be done to us, yes. but don't take it personal. Mm -mm. Even if there are problems that are happening in our lives and people hurting us, yeah. you know, God still has a special That's work so for true. us to do. So yes. we hope that you enjoy that sermon today. Also, we are in the month of July, and so this is our seventh month as a church, and so we're going to be trying to rest, amen, yes. and we pray that you find rest as well, but rest 
safely. Yes. Keep your distance, mask up, yes. wash your hands, make sure you're being safe. And also make sure as you're home chilling, try to find something to do, pick up a book. Oh yes. Set our, our, our reading list this past week and you can also access it through our website. So please make sure you're picking up a book and expanding your mind through this time of rest. Oh yes, oh, yes. And speaking of rest, you know every week I try and you know offer some type yeah. of word that's relevant to this moment. And I think, you, you know, got? in some sense, you, you know, rest is revolutionary. Oh, you know, in, yes. in, in a society that wants us to continue to yes. work and be exhausted, That's if we want to see change, yeah. uh, we're going to need to rest. Jesus yes. went rest. away and rested, <laughs> rested so that he can be a liberating and healing presence in yes. the world. And as you're resting on this Sabbath, realize that the change you want to see, as I asked earlier, how are you going to change the world? Yeah. The change that you want to see is going to be a change that's built from rest. Yes. So make sure you rest, make sure you self-care, take care of yourself, and allow the Lord to really encourage you this week. That's what I'm talking about. Peace. Oh, peace. Take care. <laughs>